Right, let's move over then. What about if we talk about... Let's do a bit of G2. What about G2? Obviously, they've lost now, but to be fair... I don't think anyone ever really, like, believes G2 losses are real. You know what I mean? Like, if they lose, we just think, like, were they playing with their food? Did they fucking round? You know, were they just bored from winning too much? Like, can you actually analyse this as a real loss? Like, are there actually some some holes opening up? Can we? Is there any hope for anyone else? Okay. Um, <laughs> my, my issue with G2 is not going to be coming from the Fnatic loss, right? Because I, I think that one, they just decided to, to have a moment and have a happy game, you know, as, as they like to say. They just went there and just <laughs> repeatedly died on mid lane. Top lane just decided to run it down. The game was completely won once they got the double kill and smolder. They, they, they actually have no business losing the game at all. But they just decided, you know what, screw it. We're just going to flex here. Oops, we got outplayed 2v2. Um, and then... They just found themselves having to, to struggle against a, a fanatic that was like 7,000, 8,000 go ahead in like 15 minutes. And the, the game should have been completely unwinnable, but they almost made it look close with the scaling that he had, right? They put up they put up a very good defense and attempt to to hold in the game. And this is the this is the exactly the type of things that I want to be seeing from, from a team that wants to be challenging against the, the Asian teams, right? Uh my concern with G2 is X and the way that he has been playing. I know it's been a whole like little bit of a meme where Mickey X almost in thing these team fights, but it turns yes. out it was a bait all along. Yes. And this is a thought of things where sure you're getting away with, with it now because the integrity of these kill squads are not exactly there there yet. But if this starts to get scouted by people, if people know that you are playing uh so on the edge and you actually die in these these scenarios, you you're actually going to become a liability for the team, yes. right? I'm not sure if he is reading the game correctly because there are some situations where I see that he actually sees information that lets him know that he might be able to get away with this and that's why he's doing the things that he's doing. Um, but it's one of those things where I probably need a larger sample size to, to say definitively if this is him playing on the limits or if this is him actually uh, going to be a liability when he plays against top elite level Asian competition. I will say it's not just like stylistically, especially when they were on the engaged champs that him and Hillasang had similarities, but I actually have heard, I even know Mickey X. I actually know that he also has a similar kind of like style. Essentially, he's very instinctive and like plays of intuition. Like a lot of the moves he makes is actually why they both were sort of up and down when, when they would have Reckless because Reckless isn't the guy who goes in and follows up, whereas they're the guys who always go in and always want the follow-up. So the downside of that is it's like the classic um, problem whenever you have a player like this, Jensen, if you're the coach is it's like the saying goes I'll give you the analogy way back in the day when Kobe Bryant was first coached by Phil Jackson who'd already won all the championships with Michael Jordan and the Bulls so he actually had sort of the authority where he could potentially come in as a coach and tell someone who hasn't won yet you know change up like this or do it. he basically famously told an assistant coach like oh we're not actually going to coach Kobe that way we're not going to tell him like all the things he's doing wrong now what we're going to do is we're going to let him like sort of breathe in the role as it were and we're just going to like very very carefully and subtly nudge him because what he said was he's like a, a mustang like a wild horse that has all this like talent and protect but if you just basically like break it immediately and put the saddle on it and make it then it'll never be what the mustang was it'll never have like the the upside as it were and like the skills to me that's also the problem with people like hillisang and mickey x's i know that a lot of their best coaches have taken that approach it's why when it goes really bad like last split with hillisang they look like they're mega egregiously inting because they're just being given the green light in a way that another player wouldn't be but you do it because you know that when it works like Mickey X last year, it's fucking amazing. Like you actually have like a mega OP player. I even think they're they're the two players historically that if they're at their best, actually give you the chance for the upset against the Asian team because they actually can sometimes be as good mechanically as the Asian support. And I think that's insane because if, if you know the players like the Carriers and the Bings of the world, they are actually like like they're as good as our mid laners mechanically, guys. They're really fucking good. So I think it, I understand why these players have their ups and downs. I agree with you though. I do think that this split it's definitely been way more scuffed. I even think if you look at the five. Final, him and fucking Hans Sam were fucking... There were some egregious players considering they won that final. So I agree. It's a, The problem is it, it can't be punished enough in LEC. Even if someone else wins another B or one, it doesn't matter. In the playoffs, still still be fine. The obvious issue is, let's do it. Let's talk about if they were to go international because there's a big discussion about this. I was actually kind of surprised, Jensen. You're on my Discord. Some of the people on my Discord aren't on the usual sort of like Asian teams. Um, are the fucking... 
uh, are, the, are really good, but you know, you don't really, here's the problem. It's actually never been the case that there was people who just said all the LCK is good and all the West trash. Maybe LS sort of did that a little bit, but actually most people I think have more of a reasonable opinion, which is sort of like the top end of the LPL and the LCK is the best. But if you get whoever the best in the West is years back, maybe it was a team liquid and it was G2 or for that, whoever, depending on the year, the top, top, top team, though, usually should be essentially, not a contender, but for me, a dark horse if they were in those regions. Like they could be like fourth to fifth, or they could make a playoff run. Hence why, at Worlds, if they get one upset series, they could be in a semi-final or a final. It makes sense, right? My problem is this. For this year, I think people are doing this thing, dude, where even if they watch LPL and LCK, they're not making themselves actually sit down and write down a real power ranking of where they would put the teams. They're just doing that thing where they sort of think to themselves, well, the LPL is always really good, so they'll always have like four or five elite teams. And then LCK, well, they've got four or five. They're not actually thinking who the top teams are. Because here's the question. It's an exercise I want every fan at home. If you think you have the right answer, you have to pause the video after I say this and take this challenge, okay? When I say to you that G2 is a top 10 team in the world. Dude, I'm not just saying that like they can creep in at 10th. I don't think people realize. I watch the LPL and the LCK, all the top teams. Mate, there's a very top heavy leagues right now. Like, I actually think they're way higher than top 10, mate. I think they might even be like fifth best team in the world or something. Like, if I look at who would beat them, because here's the thing, it's not who can beat them, it's who like would beat them if you sort of played them 10 times in a series. Yes, obviously I'll give like BLG, GG, immediately I can give you those ones. Then I'd probably put in like, yeah, I'd still put T1 in. They're so intelligent how they play. Maybe I'd chuck in like JDG. Kanavi's pretty fucking insane. Ruver is still the king. They're bottling some. But I'll tell you what, even though a lot of people then would quickly throw in a lot of other names, Jensen, they'd put in, oh yeah, and Top Esports and um, and Hanwell Light. And say, I don't know that. I, I would start to question those ones, actually, mate. I don't know. Actually, I do think Peak G2, this one, in a best of five against like Hanwell or like Top Esports or something, I don't know that that's as open and shut as people think, mate. I'm not saying I'm dead, like G2's way better. I think that's a very interesting discussion, though. I actually do think like the sleeper is, even if the West isn't good, I think this G2 team actually is pretty fucking good. I think they probably could mix it. Where are you at on that one? Are you going more or worse where would you be at on that one oh i am then very high like like i said if, if i'm looking through my checklist is what i think makes a team good they think basically every checkbox that Perfect. i'm seeing right now they right. understand the elements of map control they know how to extend the lead when i hit they know how to play from behind they have a solid understanding of how the jungle interacts with the, with the lane early uh probably the, the barren scenarios i haven't really think that but that's like a very minor minor uh thing in that long checklist of things that i have but they basically think all the check boxes so i i have them up there really high right now i've not done my deep dive onto some of the top teams in the lpl yeah, sure. but from what i'm seeing there's a lot of missing check marks in all of those check boxes as well right uh but i i think that with regards to this so just to add another dimension to this i think that there is one very big element of change that has happened to the game which is the the way that team fights around drakes is happening so I do think that the game has kind of been, uh, I wouldn't say soft, soft, but it's been kind of like figured out, right? You reach the Drake first, and then there are these possible scenarios that can happen when you have first access to the river around Drake. You control the chokes, the team, the opponent team walks in. Based on the type of team composition that you have, you control these areas accordingly. But the team that then has control is able to win the game, to, to win the fight, and then be able to convert, I would say, easily 80% of the time. But what we're seeing right now, in uh, even in the Asian regions, is that what are the exact protocols in terms of what do you do when you're set up around the river at this point of time? And I have belief to to think that it's going to be raid side favorite a little bit from what I've seen so far. But the team that can figure that out, because I have to say that this is kind of like League of Legends version uh, one point. I mean, technically it's one point fourteen, but it's a it's a very that soft or that figure out aspect of the game has been changed in a very drastic way. And that Drake team fight has been such a large part of the last two to three years that now teams, whoever can figure out that this is actually the exact protocols that you take in terms of how you control this. Do we need to control the Crescent Bush? Do we just avoid taking Drakes altogether as blue side team because of the, the map disadvantage that's happening? And how does that impact the game? The team that actually figures that out would then have the best success at the international events. So it's very hard to say because this is trying to make a prediction as to who is going to uh, who is going to find a breakthrough in terms of the scrims and things like that. And I have to say that the bias would definitely go more towards the Asian teams because they can get themselves more into those type of scenarios. But then again, team fights are, some, are things that happen in almost every game. So it's not to say that this is like the high level macro that you only you have to be screaming in in the Asian regions to really experience. So um, it's kind of it's kind of a free game for everybody. But if you were to just ask in terms of like just direct power rankings, 
right now I, I do have them about 56 as well yeah, because you know, what I was going to say, I actually didn't complete the challenges. If you're one of those people who hears that statement, and don't get me wrong, I understand that the problem with like these statements is until you actually analyze the specifics, it's going to seem like a wild statement. Like when I said, not just even top 10, I, maybe they're like fifth, so I said you top five. Your brain just tells you, no, wait, think of all the, but no, no, sit down, pause the video and just write down a list of no teams that would you think would definitely beat G2. And I'll be shocked if you can get 10, put it that way. Because I, like I say, especially like LCK, LCK is mad. It's, I, I made hand with life. I'm being generous there. If you go beyond that, man, I don't care. I think G2 would beat fucking D plus and KT. I think they would murk these teams. Like, look, these teams could win a game off them. Of course, you've got people like Showmaker and fucking BDD. But actually, as a series, I'm with you. If you check, if you look at what a team can do, this team is way more complete than people give them credit for. It's actually one of the rare teams where I do agree with running it back. Like, this lineup is one of the rare ones that Dorks like it really did learn from its lessons last year, maintain and expand. And then the last factor I'll just throw in there, which actually wasn't there for most of the last year, is Bro, the cap's Factor internationally looks like it might be back. Like, the, remember how dope it was when even when G2 wasn't their best, you knew if Caps got onto a game like he did famously against Gen G and those like Silas games at that 2020 Worlds. When he would play, then you were like, oh, wait, we have one player who really can be the best in the server, even against the Asian player. Dude, he's back. That guy is back. He has those pop-off games again where, like, I could see him winning you that BO1 in the Swiss system at some point at Worlds. It gets you close to the playoff. It, it guy can do it himself as well as the team being good. So, yeah, I, that's a challenge I'll set everyone. Sit down and do it. And th listen, this is the one good thing. There's so much doomer sort of black pill stuff about, like, the game's in a bad spot and the West's fallen. And, you know, like, LCS, for example, looks terrible right now. The difference is G2 can actually but they're like the real last hope they actually are good like I, i'm not taking it like they're just you know a big fish in a small pond g lec shit no i think they actually are good for real guys like and i think it will be proven at msi so i'm really excited for that even though look obviously msi does not have the third and fourth best teams in those regions but i think you'll see they'll be competitive they'll, they'll mix it up it'll be good right what about I mean, um go on oh uh, i just want to chip in something yeah, right? because i think that one of the, the, the things it. that's kind of been glossed over is the bringing back Duffman to the team, right? Because I think I believe Duffman was the was one of their, their analysts that the players gave a lot of props to, and he was working with the team when they had the legendary training. Oh, sure, season. yes. And uh, even though when I watched this team play last year, Duffman was working for Cloud9 at a point of time, that just felt to me like any other uh, decent European League of Legends team, right? They played lanes decently well, they will win lanes on average, but you didn't see this level of... of uh, I would say intensity, the execution of these protocols. And I'm not sure how much of this is Duffman's contribution, not to take anything away from the little Falco grabs, right? But this is the, the one factor that I see was added to the team that has really created this um, level up, this, this glow up into this G2 as, as to why I'm a believer for them this year and why last year I felt that even though people were hyping them up, I never thought that they really had a big chance at Worlds, even though it was kind of disappointing because they got those wins over the weaker Asian teams and then they lost the NRG. So it was a question mark in the air. To me, I never really gave them a chance. I actually think that this G2 is a contender and um, it even has a chance. Like when I say Replicate 2019 G2, it's a very, very tall task, right? Because it's basically almost a grandstand. They were just missing the one last best of five in, in the year itself. So it's... um. It's a, it's, it's a tough ask to do it, but I think that this team can possibly do it. And if people don't know, as that guy on Reddit even showed, if you actually sort of take strength of teams at that Worlds, G2 actually had the hardest Swiss bracket, like run of anyone in the whole tournament, believe it or not. They actually drew the hardest possible opponents almost at every stage. And so in a sense, that's it's one of the reasons why I told everyone before Worlds, I don't like that style of unseeded Swiss where the randomised element means you just get people like Katie Rolster and G2 get mega unfair draws. Meanwhile, like NRG literally gets one of the best draws in the whole fucking tournament, even though they aren't even like, they, they should shouldn't even be seeded as high as G2 and fucking, especially not Katie Rolster. So yeah, I thought that one was wild. To see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content, well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.